Hey, happy Saturday, everybody. Um, sorry I'm running a little bit behind today. I was trying to find, or get my mic rather, but unfortunately I failed to charge it the other day, so hopefully the audio sounds okay. All right, first one is, how do we get a better form with post? The stand command. Please describe steps of the process. We're not ready for shaping box yet. She confused hand signal with touch, so she's coming towards me and doesn't always stand straight and center. Well, when I'm teaching the stand command, of course we wanna be able to present a physical cue that's going to guarantee our dog's going to do the behavior. Now, if we take the food and we guide it towards our dog's chest, usually their back end is going to pop up. This doesn't always happen though, especially if you start it off teaching your dog how to walk backwards. They may wanna walk backwards, or they may think you're trying to cue them into a down since your hand is starting to go below their um, eyesight or their nose level, and that's usually when they think they're going into a down position. So sometimes what I might do is I might help the dog a little bit with my hand, and some dogs, when they jump up into the stand, they may choose to jump to the right or slightly to the left. If that happens, if I notice my dog is jumping up, but to the right when they go into the stand position, then I'm gonna place a wall or I'm gonna put my dog rather next to a wall. So when I cue him or her into the stand position, the wall is going to prevent them from moving to the side. Again, we can also help with our hand. Another option is to teach your dog a belly band. A belly band is where we use a collar to put it around the dog's waist, and then we treat the, or we teach the dog how to respond to the pressure the same way we would when we're doing leash pressure training. So what I mean by that, when we start to apply leash pressure, remember, in order for leash pressure, which I believe it should be called a leash cue, in order for that to work, two things must take place. Number one, once the pressure is turned on, it cannot be turned off until the dog complies. And number two, the moment the dog complies, it has to instantly be turned off. It's the same thing when we're doing leash pressure around the dog's waist. It helps teach the dog to pop up their back end. When we're teaching our dog leash pressure, remember we're presenting our dog with a problem. And if we want to reduce the stress associated with that type of training, what we want to do is we want to give our dog the answer. So if you know how I do my leash training process, I start the pressure. That's the problem. Then I give the dog the answer by luring them into the desired position. So for example, if I wanted to get my dog to go into a sit with leash pressure and I'm teaching my dog leash pressure, I'll lift up with the leash ever so slightly. Then I will take the food and I'll lure the dog into the sit. The moment the dog sits, I turn off the pressure and I give the dog the reward. We can do the same thing if we're teaching our dog how to respond to a belly band. In fact, I think I demonstrate that in my how to teach your dog to stand video. It's another option to help make sure the dog stands correctly and maintains the position. I also have a video on teaching the stand for exam for AKC obedience. That process will also help when teaching the stand command. Okay, next question. And um, by the way, I have to go through my channel member questions first. Once I answer all those, then I'll start jumping to the other questions. So the next one is, I live in an apartment and I need my puppy to be able to go to the bathroom inside and out. She has got the going outside down pretty good. I just don't know how to train her for the inside as well. Also, I'm in nursing school. She'll be 18, 19 weeks when I start again. Do I need to get a sitter for her? Thank you so much for your help. Okay, um, so teaching a dog to go to the bathroom inside, if you already taught your dog to go to the bathroom outside and they think that's the only place they're supposed to go to the bathroom. If you watch my video on teaching the Brilliant Pad, so the Brilliant Pad, it's an excellent potty system if you have a dog that needs to go to the bathroom inside, whether you live in an apartment and you can't always find the time to take the dog outside, Brilliant Pad is a great option. It can sense the dog going to the bathroom when the dog leaves. It wraps it up automatically, removing any odor, any smell. But if you watch that video, you'll see how I start with a dog that 
goes to the bathroom outside. You find the spot that your dog goes to the bathroom and then you place the Brilliant Pad there. If you're using something like potty pads, you can do the same thing. To make it more clear, what I like to do is get a storage container, one that's not very deep, maybe four to six inches, but it's wider. So it's almost like using, it's almost like a cat litter box, I guess you could say, but it's a little bit bigger. So I use it for small dogs if I'm teaching them to go on potty pads. The reason why, if you've had a smaller dog, any of you had a small dog and you're teaching that dog or a puppy to use a potty pad, which again, if we're using a potty pad, remember you are teaching your dog to go to the bathroom inside the house. If that's what you want and that's more feasible to your living situation, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you want your dog, if you want your dog to go to the bathroom outside, then I recommend not using potty pads. But a puppy or a dog might smell the potty pad and then they go pee or number two and they think they're going on the pad, but they're missing the pad entirely. So by using this storage style container, taking the lid off, maybe it's four inches deep, six inches deep, something like that, and I place the potty pads in there, the dog has to jump in the container in order to go to the bathroom. So the likelihood of them missing is much lower than what it was before. So then with that, as the dog starts to understand going in that container outside, if your dog is so used to going outside, gradually over time, I slowly move it closer and closer to being inside. And usually that'll help the dog go to the bathroom. Another option, if you don't have the time to do the process like that, what I would do is in the morning when I have to take the dog to go to the bathroom and we know the dog has to go to the bathroom, I would take the dog to the indoor potty location. I would set the dog in the potty location and I would wait three minutes. The same way or the same process I would follow when I'm teaching a dog to go to the bathroom outside. I wait three minutes. If the dog goes to the bathroom, yay, good job, pet the dog and then I'll do something that the dog enjoys, whether that's going on a walk, playing with some toys, doing some obedience training. I'm gonna let the dog know that going to the bathroom predicts an activity that is more enjoyable. If the dog doesn't go to the bathroom in those three minutes, no big deal. I pick them up, I place them back inside of their kennel or crate, and then I simply, then I simply wait another 20 minutes, I take the dog back out, I repeat the process. And I continue to do that until the dog goes to the bathroom. Since the dog already has to go to the bathroom in the morning, then that's a great opportunity in order to teach the dog to go to the bathroom in the container. Okay, uh, let's see. Squirrel and small mammal desensitization. Luna has strong prey drive for ground squirrels and cats. If I catch it in time, I can make her sit. She keeps eyes locked on and is so attracted or so active her whole body shakes how do i progress with this to reduce her interest and reactivity i'd like to be able to put her in a down and have a squirrel run by her without her twitching and bringing her has and and bring her around house cats safely okay so if we're working on getting a dog desensitized to small mammals that's going to be a process that will take a time that will take time especially if the dog has very high prey drive. So some dogs that have high prey drive, a good way to look at it, if you watch my video on generalizing your dog and socializing them or grading them, if I start working. So you wanna think about what's the easiest environment to train our dogs in? Well, an environment, a completely empty room, that's going to be the best environment to start training a dog in because you don't have to compete with any additional motivating factors. You're the only thing in the room and so you become more interesting because there's nothing in order for you to compete with. Once I get the dog pretty good in that information, once I get the dog pretty good in that situation, then I can gradually start to make it more difficult. So. Let's look at it this way. When we're thinking about the concept of getting a dog generalized to something, it's usually around eight or nine of whatever it is that you're working towards in order to get the dog generalized. This is why competition obedience dog trainers, they train at multiple locations. So when they go compete, the dog is generalized and they know they have to do the obedience 
regardless of where they are. And that's very important if you want reliability for your dog's training. So what I like to do is I'll teach my dog in a neutral environment all the basic obedience. I'll go through the first few steps. Engagement training, luring, leash pressure, teaching the commands, working on the stay. Once I feel like I have a good foundation, then I'm going to start introducing environments that are more difficult. If I notice I start training my dog in an environment that is too difficult for my dog, I'm gonna make sure I end on a good note, then I'm gonna go to an environment that's much easier and work my way back up to where I was. So don't rush the training process when it comes to new environments. And the new environments includes small mammals. So if I'm trying to train a dog that's still very new in the training, and I'm trying to work obedience at a park on a Saturday where people are barbecuing, you have animals running around, other dogs barking, working a downstay with those distractions is going to be very difficult for a dog that is early on in the training. So progress at the speed in which your dog is getting proficient at and gradually make it more difficult. But again, if you notice it's too hard for your dog, go back a little bit and work your way up. That's really a big part of that concept of desensitization with anything that it is that we're trying to get our dogs desensitized to. We introduce it at a very low stimuli and we gradually increase that stimuli as the dog becomes better. Okay, I have a herding dog, Gracie, most Australian cattle dog, mostly Australian cattle dog, German Shepherd. She tends to herd my other dog anyway to get her to stop hurting. Okay, so that is going to look at behavioral issues. So when we're working on behavioral issues, we have two main issues when it comes to working with our dogs. We have obedience issues and we have behavioral issues. For obedience issues, we only have two that we have to worry about. A dog not staying in a stay and a dog not doing a commanded behavior. For behavioral issues, we have five main behavioral issues that we have to focus on. And it's very easy to remember these. We have dangerous and destructive. Those two pretty much go together. Fear and aggression, those can go together as well. And then behaviors we just don't want our dogs to perform. So something like one dog hurting another dog, that could be potentially dangerous if the other dog ended up becoming aggressive for that behavior. But more likely than not, if the two dogs are together, it's just probably something that's annoying the dog that's being herded by the first dog. In a situation like that, I like to start with my marker that predicts negative reinforcement, going back to leash pressure. Remember, in order for a marker to be a marker, it must predict one of the four quadrants of opera conditioning. So that's your positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment. So easy way to remember that because again, people confuse this all the time because they think positive means good and negative means bad. But really positive is adding to the equation. Negative is removing something from the equation. Reinforcement is encouraging the repeat of a behavior. Punishment is preventing the repeat of a behavior. So we can use negative reinforcement to reinforce the behavior we would prefer our dog to do in any situation. Now, remember with our markers, there's certain words that I like to use and often I'll have people ask, they'll say, do I have to say wrong all the time or do I have to say free? You can say whatever words you choose, just be consistent with whatever you determine your marker is going to be. So with the dogs that I train, I like to use yes and free as my markers that predict positive reinforcement. I use no as my marker that predicts positive punishment. And I use wrong for my marker that predicts negative reinforcement. That's going to be our leash pressure. So we have to make sure that our dog is already trained on leash pressure. When we say wrong and we use the leash pressure to show our dog what we want them to do, this becomes very very transferable. I use it when I'm teaching stays. The dog breaks the stay. I say wrong. I calmly grab the leash. I place the dog back into the stay. The dog goes into a room that 
the dog is not allowed to go into. I say wrong, I use a leash, I remove the dog from the room. Let's say the dog jumps up on the furniture and you don't want the dog on the furniture. You say wrong, you use a leash to cue the dog off of the furniture. The dog jumps up on somebody, wrong, you use a leash to cue them off of that person. So what's nice about this, it's not a punishment. We've taught the dog negative reinforcement so they know how to respond to it. And since we've used it in different situations, it becomes very, very transferable. And what it ends up meaning to our dog is stop what you're doing, go back to the pre or go back to the previous position or pay attention to me because I'm going to show you what I want you to do. This is what I would probably use in this situation. I would make sure I have either a tab on the dog that likes to do the herding behavior or I would have a long line so I can communicate with the dog from farther away. I wait until the dog does the herding behavior. The moment the dog does that behavior, I calmly say, wrong. I walk over to the dog and I redirect my dog to a behavior that I would prefer my dog to do. And I do this every single time without fail. The dog's going to learn that doing that ends up predicting you using your marker that predicts negative reinforcement, which predicts the behavior you would prefer your dog to do. And what's going to end up happening when you say wrong, your dog will end up doing the behavior you've shown your dog to do when you use that marker. Once I get to that point, that tells me that the dog knows what they're supposed to do. I've given them a very clear path to success and I've taught them how to turn off pressure by complying. And when we say wrong, in a sense, we become the pressure because we're telling the dog, I'm gonna show you what I want you to do and I'm going to continue it until you do what I'm pretty much asking you to do. So for example, if the dog breaks it down, I say wrong, I grab the leash. After I say wrong, I walk to the dog, I grab the leash, I walk the dog back to where they are and I where they were and then I place them into the down position. So we don't have to say anything else after we say wrong. Wrong is telling the dog, I'm going to show you what I want you to do. Once the dog starts to respond to wrong, and this goes with all my obedience as well, my stay command, if the dog breaks the stay and I say wrong and the dog goes back to the stay, then if I want reliability at that point, I can now add corrections. So instead of the dog, when they break the position saying wrong, now I'm going to say no. Instead of using leash pressure, I'm going to give the dog a correction with a leash pop. Then I'm going to repeat the command that I want the dog to perform. So if I'm, let's say we're working on the stay, then I would tell the dog climb or whatever the behavior it is that we're working on. And then I would assist the dog if needed. So when we start adding corrections, it's no, correction, recommand, and then assist. What we don't want to do is we don't want to continue to correct the dog for the same mistake over and over again. So what I mean by that, you wouldn't want to go sit, no, correction, sit, no, correction, sit, no, correction. You would not want to do that because when we do start adding corrections into our training routine, that creates additional stress. When we add stress into our training, our dogs are not going to be able to think as clearly as they are able to think when there's no stress associated. So we have to keep that in mind. We don't want to continue to correct because again, that additional stress is going to make it harder for our dogs. So I said sit, the dog didn't sit, no correction. I recommand sit. And then if the dog needs it, I'm going to help them, whether by using a lure or by using the leash pressure, but I'm going to make sure that the dog is successful. Then I'm gonna let them know, nice job, good boy or good girl, whatever the case may be. Okay. Okay, so now we're looking at a dog that doesn't like to be moved from a comfy spot and doesn't like his nails touched. Okay, so if I have a dog that doesn't want to be moved from a position, anytime our dogs do a certain behavior, we set our dogs up for success so we can reward them the exact moment they do the behavior correctly, but we also want to set our dogs up for failure so we can reinforce rules at the correct time as well. So in a situation like this, if I know I have a dog that doesn't want to be moved, let's say the dog is on the couch 
And this will actually go to another point. If I allow my dog on the furniture and my dog starts to resource guard the furniture, well, now that's a problem and I'm probably not going to allow the dog to stay on the furniture anymore because now the dog's starting to resource guard it. It's an issue and it needs to be addressed and it needs to be fixed. However, if the dog, it's also going to depend if the dog is younger or if the dog is bluffing. So I talk about this in my training manual. Some dogs will bluff, meaning they're going to act out of behavior that appears to be aggressive, but they're not willing to follow through. Now, of course, if you're going to work with a dog and you're not sure if the dog's going to follow through or not, you're taking a chance. And what I mean by that is, Let's look at a young puppy. Let's say a puppy is starting to resource guard a toy. If I go to grab that toy and that puppy snarls, grabs a hold of the toy, pulls it in and looks at me as if the dog's or as if the puppy's going to bite me, I'm just going to grab the toy. I'm going to allow the puppy to bite me. I'm just going to sit there and show the puppy that it doesn't have any sort of effect or impact on me. Once the puppy stops biting, I release the toy and I say, good puppy, nice job. Then I go back and I grab it again. Puppy tries to bite me again. I wait, the puppy stops biting. Once they stop, good puppy, I release the toy. And I keep doing this, and what's going to end up happening is the puppy is going to look at my hand when I grab the toy, look up at me, I release, the puppy can go back to the toy. So I'm showing them just because my hand is grabbing the toy doesn't mean that I'm going to take it away from you. We also have older dogs that will bluff. So. You might try to, I had a dog, let's, let me tell you another example. I had this uh, sheep dog that I was training and this dog was allowed to get away with anything that he wanted up until the point of being trained. And he would pull on the leash and so I was working on loose leash walking. I started off with leash pressure, everything was fine. Once I started adding corrections, he would act like he was going to bite me. He would go in front of me, I would say, no, I would do a leash pop after the leash pop, he would growl and then he would jump back like he was going to attack me. And I would just say the command that I wanted him to do after the correction, heal, and I would just make him go into the heel position because I could tell he was bluffing. But anyways, let's just be safe with this situation. Keep a leash on your dog and then ask your dog to leave the commanded position and then use the leash to reinforce those rules and continue to do that as many times as it takes for when you ask your dog Finn to leave the comfortable position, your dog will do it automatically because you've reinforced those rules and those expectations. So if you need to keep a leash on him while he's relaxing in the house until you no longer have to use the leash to reinforce the rules. A leash is going to be a means to an end. If we have to have a leash on our dog inside the house, it's because we're still working on potty training and we're still working on house manners. This would fall under the category of house manners. The dog isn't fully trained on house manners yet, so I would probably keep either a tab on the dog or a leash. When the dog's in that position, I'm going to give the dog the command off and then I'm going to use the leash to reinforce it. If the dog does become aggressive and tries to bite at me, I can use the leash to prevent that forward movement. Once the dog relaxes, I can turn off the pressure. Nice job, good boy. Remember, anytime we are correcting our dogs, we wanna make sure that it's never personal. It's always cause and effect. The dog does the behavior, I respond a certain way. I'm never mad, I'm never upset. I want the dog to understand that their behavior is what is causing my actions. So if I do have to correct a dog, I'm often thinking to myself like, hey, I got, you're telling me to correct you. I don't wanna correct you, but you told me to correct you, so I'm going to comply. So I'm not mad or upset. We don't want to ever try to, uh, like contrary to popular belief, it's not about being the alpha. It's not about dominating our dogs. It's about being on the same team, working towards a common goal. And if you have to adjust something, again, it's always cause and effect. So the dog's up there, off, cue the dog off. Yay, nice job. And then again, continue to do that until the dog responds on the command alone without the help of the physical cue. All right, my five month old puppy jumps and bites guests butt. As he tries to herd them, it's embarrassing. He mouths them as well. Should I correct him or teach my guests how to respond to the puppy? 
if I have a puppy that's doing something like that, I'm gonna correct that just right away. I'm gonna do a little leash pop. I'll let my friends know that are coming over. I'll say, I'm working with my puppy. It's a herding dog, so she likes to jump up and nip. When she does that, I'm going to make a correction. No big deal. So the moment the puppy does the behavior, no, leash pop. The moment the puppy stops, yay, good boy, or whatever. It's the same thing with a dog biting a leash. This is very, very common. So uh, for example, yesterday I worked with about five different dogs, maybe it was six different dogs. We were filming a few more episodes and two of the dogs tried biting the leash. And the owner said, this is an issue. My dog always bites the leash. When we tried doing leash pressure work or we're starting to do loose leash walking, the dog would bite the leash. Very common. All I do when a dog bites the leash is I pop it out of their mouth. They may try to bite it one more time. I pop it out of their mouth again and the dog goes, well, that's no fun. I'm not going to continue biting the leash. So it's the same with this. This is something I'm going to correct. And I know I don't have videos demonstrating a correction, but all it is, it's, a, it's just a little pop. And I do have a video where I demonstrate a leash pop, but not on a dog. Uh, let me see, I don't have a leash in here, but what I can do, I'll just use this. So I would tell the dog no, and then pop the leash like that. That would be a leash pop. Notice that the start point and the end point is the same for the hand that's popping the leash. Okay, let's see what's next. Also, my, also in the car, my puppy drools like crazy. That's another common issue that a lot of people run into. He gets anxious and just freezes. Also in my car, um, if my friend's truck, in my friend's truck, he's perfectly fine. What could cause this and how do I fix it? He will not take any treats while in my car. Okay, so if I have a dog that doesn't like being in a car, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to first teach the dog how to jump in and out of the car without taking the dog anywhere. We want to start creating a strong positive association to the vehicle. So I had one dog that I was working with before that was terrified of being in the car. And before I even moved the car with the dog inside of the vehicle, I got the dog comfortable eating in the vehicle. And just like you said, the dog didn't want to take the food at first. When a dog is in a position where they are stressed out, anxious, they won't want to take food from us. This reminds me of another story where I was, I was teaching a Labrador retriever to be comfortable in public. This dog was terrified of being out in public. And when I first had the dog out in public, the dog would not take any food. But this is what I do in these situations. I don't feed the dog in any other location until they start taking food from the location that I'm trying to get the dog comfortable with. Or using toys is another good option. Someone said train using toys. Um, yes, toys is great if your dog enjoys toys, but what I would do is I would take the dog out, I would have them go into the vehicle, I would offer them food. If they don't want any food, I'd have them come back out and I would try again at dinner. And I'm not going to give them any food in between that training exercise. I bring the dog back out, I have the dog jump in the vehicle, I offer the, the dog food. If the dog doesn't want food there, maybe I'm gonna try to do some obedience right next to the vehicle with the door open and I'm going to feed the dog there. So this would go right in line with counter conditioning and desensitization. We introduce it at the lowest stimuli possible, even if that means we're just next to the vehicle and we're not in the vehicle, but whatever we need to do to make the dog comfortable. If you have another dog that is comfortable inside of the vehicle, that can also help a dog overcome those fears. And I wouldn't worry about the dog's fine in the truck, but the dog's not okay in the car. We know the dog's not okay in the car, so that's what we're going to focus on. I had another dog that had the same issue, but the dogs that that dog lived with was comfortable in the car. So we got all three of the dogs in the vehicle. We would drive it around for 30 seconds and then we would allow the dogs to come out and we would do this over and over again and gradually increase the amount of time that we had the dogs in the vehicle. Another thing that's important to keep in mind, there are people out there that will only take their dog in the vehicle when they're going somewhere like the veterinarian clinic. If that's the case, the dog is not going to like being in the vehicle because it always predicts something unpleasant. Another great way to get the dog to like the vehicle is every time you go in the car, take them very short distance, but somewhere where the dog enjoys. So um, here's a great example with that. Ari for a while did not like going 
to the car. And the reason why, a few years back, she ended up getting a thorn in her eyeball. And I had to take her down to a specialist. They were able to remove the thorn, stitch it up. It was great. Only cost me $5,000. No big deal. But she had to go back multiple times. We had to put drops in her eyes, the works. And she didn't like going to the vehicle after that. She was terrified of it. Well, I like to take my dogs to the park every day, not the dog, dog park. I just take them to a normal park and I'll play chuck it with them. I'll do a little bit of tug. I'll play frisbee. Anything that my dogs enjoy that's going to get them a little bit tired and I can incorporate some obedience. So I just did that every single day. And after about a week, she was back to normal, super excited to go to the vehicle because she goes, oh yeah, the vehicle means we're going to the park not going because I got a thorn in my eyeball. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Make sure it predicts something nice. Keep the drives very, very short once you start getting the dog into the vehicle. Even something as simple as starting the car and then turning off the engine. Okay. A uh, five-month-old German Shepherd dog. Partner unable to follow through, correct with rules, etc. No jumping, biting, or taking things from his hands. Partner just keeps allowing it. Should I correct dog myself? Any other op options? Okay, that can be difficult if there are other people in the house and they're not following the rules. If that's the case, I'm just going to work with the dog and train the dog as if the dog's only my dog. I'm going to do the obedience. I'm going to exercise the dog, play with the dog, all that good stuff. Dogs are very, very situational. They can, just like kids can tell whether the which parent is going to give in, which parent is going to allow them to have what it is that they want. Dogs are the same way. They can identify which one gives them whatever they want, which one reinforces rules and expectations. So dogs also like structure. I would just continue to work with the dog, train them. If you can't convince your partner to help with it, oh well, I'm not gonna stress that too much and I'm going to work with my dog. When I went through school, I was told if I train my dog and I leave my dog with somebody, let's say a friend or family, and they don't reinforce any of the training, I'm going to come back and it's going to be as if I never trained my dog. And I was so worried and I was so stressed out about that. that I didn't want people giving my dog commands. I didn't want people handling my dog with a leash, nothing, because I had this fear that when I get the dog back, if they made mistakes, it's going to show with my dog. Now in a long enough timeline, let's say you leave for a few months and you come back, you're gonna have to put your dog through a little bit of refresher training, but they do remember. A good example is I did scent detection with a golden retriever that I trained to be a service dog. And the dog was very, very exceptional at scent detection training and search and rescue training. Such a pleasure to work with. I did not train scent detection for about two years. And then at about two years, I started doing scent detection training again with this dog and the dog instantly picked it right back up. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, let's see what the next one is. I would like to know your thoughts on adaptable collar for eight week old Swiss Shepherd puppy. I read that it reduces the anxiety and helps the puppy to calm down and helps her to adjust with the new home. If it's helping your dog, I would give it a shot. If it works, if it's helping your dog, then I would continue to do it. If you're not seeing anything, any success, it's not working with your dog. And this is why it's so important to understand the science of dog training and why I always talk about the science of dog training. The science is always going to be the same. We're going to use certain things to motivate our dogs to do the behaviors that we want them to perform, but we have to adjust according to each dog. One technique that may work on dog A will not work on dog B. A good example is dogs jumping up. You may have seen this on videos or you may have read this somewhere. If a dog jumps up, cross your arms, turn and ignore the dog. Once the dog stops jumping, pet and praise the dog. This technique is great if the dog's goal when the dog is jumping up is to get the human's attention. So dog goes, I want your attention, jumps up and the human's attention goes away. The dog sits and now the dog gets that attention again. The dog goes, oh great, if I want your attention, I sit nicely. But what if the dog enjoys the act of jumping? 
ignoring the behavior is no longer going to work. That's a self-reinforcing behavior. Another good example is, let's say you have an area in your backyard that you don't want your dog to go to. And so you think to yourself, you know what? Every time my dog steps in that area, I'm gonna spray my dog with the water hose. And let's say you have two dogs. One dog goes in and you spray and the dog's like, ah, I don't like that. And the dog stops going into that area. The other dog goes to that area and you spray that dog and the dog goes, oh, that water hose is awesome. And the dog sees it as a reward. So with one of the dogs, they see it as a punishment. The other dog sees it as a reward. So again, we adjust according to the dog. If it's working with your dog, then I would continue to do it if it seems like it's helping. Uh, feeding a puppy in the crate. When I'm working with a puppy, I like to do continual reinforcement while I'm training them and I will train them during mealtime. So I use mealtime as an opportunity to train my dog. I bring them out in the morning, I have my dog's food, I work with my dog, once the food is gone, the session's over, and then I can repeat that process in the evening for the puppy's mealtime. But if I'm not training the puppy, there's nothing wrong with feeding them in the crate. A lot of people do it. It's actually really nice. If you're not doing any training and you're feeding the puppy in the crate, it's good because if you have multiple dogs, it's even more helpful. But if I am feeding a dog, I do like to feed them in the crate for a couple reasons. One, it shows them that they're in a secure place and they're not going to be as worried about somebody possibly taking the food away. And if you have multiple dogs feeding them at the same time, often what will happen is the dogs will eat very quickly. One of the dogs might be eating very quickly because it wants to eat the other dog's food. And the other dog could be eating very quickly because it wants to prevent the other dog from eating their food. So when they're in the crate, it just makes it a more secure, comfortable location for them. So that's great. But if you are doing training, then I would use mealtime as an opportunity to train my dog. Something that is often asked on my videos is, do I always have to give my dog a bunch of treats? Now, of course, we want our dogs to do behaviors for us because they've been taught to do them, not because we have to hold a treat in front of our dog's face. When we start off, we always wanna use continual reinforcement. And you might say to yourself, well, what if I have a dog that is not food motivated? Every dog is food motivated. I do talk about it in my manual. Some people don't like the way that it sounds, but I like to use the correct terminology. For example, a conditioned punisher, somebody once told me, you shouldn't say conditioned punisher, it doesn't sound good. It's like, well, that's the terminology. Just like positive punishment, negative punishment, this is the actual terminology that we're going to be using. So when we are working with a dog that's not food motivated, maybe the dog has been free fed its entire life, never had to work for any food, then what I do is simple food deprivation. It doesn't mean we're going to starve the dog, but what it does mean is we're going to make the dog work for every bite of food. I bring the dog out, I show the dog a piece of food, I go, hey, you ready to train? I offer it to the dog, the dog goes, no, I'm not interested. I say, no problem, we'll try again at dinner. I bring the dog back out for dinner, I go, you ready to train? The dog says, no, I'm not interested in the food, and I say, no problem, we'll try again at breakfast. Breakfast rolls around, I offer the dog the food, the dog goes, yes, I will take that, and then I can start training and using food as a motivating factor. Remember, when our dogs do a behavior, they're doing it because of one of three reasons. Either A, the dog is doing it for the possibility of accessing something pleasant, food, toy, affection. The dog is doing the behavior because the behavior itself is fun, self-reinforcing, self-rewarding behaviors. Chasing a squirrel, that's a fun behavior. The act of chasing is fun, so the dog continues to do the behavior. Or C, the dog is doing the behavior to prevent the possibility of a consequence or a correction. So when we start off, we use continual reinforcement. I have a three-stage process that I like to follow with the dogs that I train. In the very beginning, we reward every single correct repetition. Sit, yes, reward. Down, yes, reward. Or free, whatever marker it is that you're using. Once the dog starts to do the behavior on the command alone, then I go to stage two. Stage two, when the dog does the correct behavior, I'm going to do one of two things. Either I will mark and reward as I was doing before, or I will provide the dog with verbal praise. Now I continue this step for a few weeks perhaps. 
Then I go to stage three. Stage three, when the dog does the behavior, I mark and reward, or I provide verbal praise, or I say nothing at all. And I slowly fade out, rewarding and giving the dog praise. Now, I'm still going to throw in random rewards, I'm still going to randomly praise, but it's not going to be every single time the dog does something right. Another good thing to do, if you're using your dog's kibble in the beginning to train, so I like to have my dogs on a raw diet, but when I start training them in the very beginning, I use kibble, because kibble's going to be easier to handle. I like Stella and Chewy's freeze-dried coated kibble. It comes with little freeze-dried nuggets, it's a higher quality kibble than a lot of other options out there. And then I will also add freeze dry treats in the mix while I'm training. So when they get that freeze dried piece of food, it's like a bonus and it actually makes our dogs more motivated to train. And if you are looking for good freeze dried dog food, I would highly recommend Ari and Charlie's freeze-dried dog food, which is available ariancharlies.com. I hope you guys like that plug. But that's my freeze-dried dog food that we recently released. We only have one protein source, salmon. There is a little bit of turkey in there as well, but it's mostly salmon. So if you guys are using freeze-dried dog food, definitely check that out. But going back to where we were on the question, feeding in the crate. Oh yeah, I started talking about using food for training. Started to go in a different direction there. Let's get the next question. During a focused, structured heel, my dog always walks just a little too far ahead of me. Where a left turn is difficult, when he starts inching forward, should I slow down to create distance and correct with the prong or any other suggestions? That's going to depend where our dog is in the training. Remember, a heel, even a focused heel, that's a stay command. So we have sit stay, down stay, uh, climb stay, stand stay, heel stay, center stay, come stay, which would be the sit front position. The difference is a uh, down stay is a stationary stay, whereas a heel stay, even focused heel, can become a mobile stay. So if I'm still in the early stages of teaching a dog focused heel, I'm not going to be correcting because it's still early. But if the dog is well trained, They've gone through the entire process. I'm at the point of adding corrections, then I can add corrections. But just like you said, should I wait to allow the dog to go forward? What I like to do when I'm working on a heel, this is going to apply more for our loose leash walking and less for our focused heel. Because a focused heel, the dog should be looking at us the entire time. And uh, something that Michael Ellis talks about, which is an excellent way of explaining this, something like a downstay is very black and white. The dog's elbows touch the ground, boom, the dog's in a downstay. Very clear, the dog knows what they're supposed to do. But something like loose leash walking or focused heel, that's very gray for the dog, meaning the dog may think they're doing it exactly the way that you want them to, but they don't realize that they're forging a little bit or they're lagging a little bit, or maybe they're a little bit wide. If I'm doing a focused heel, I'm going to spend a lot of time luring and working on that precision obedience. I enjoy teaching focus heel. It's very fun, it's a good exercise. I'm also going to use the leash to help guide my dog into those more precision type obedience. In addition, we can use a healing stick. I have a video on that, a healing stick. We're using negative reinforcement. That means we can guide the dog by simply applying a little bit of pressure the same way we do with the leash pressure work to to manipulate the dog's position. But if I'm doing loose leash walking and I'm just starting out, I want to make sure the dog knows how to find the heel position and I also want to make sure that the dog understands leash pressure and I've already taught stay for my stationary commands. Climb stay, down stay, sit stay. Those are really great to start with to help get the dog to understand the stay command when we start reinforcing it with our wrong marker that predicts leash pressure. So then when I say heel and I start to walk, if the dog goes ahead of me, I say wrong, I use the leash, I guide the dog back into position. Once the dog's in the position, I turn off the pressure and I go right back into the walk. The dog starts to go ahead of me again, Wrong, I use leash and I guide the dog back into the position. When I am doing this exercise, 
my goal is to leave the dog's heel position as many times as possible. I'm waiting for the dog to leave the heel position. This is important because what it does is, first of all, you can make it a game, so the training should be fun. You shouldn't be getting frustrated when your dog leaves the heel position. I make it a game. As I'm walking, I'm waiting for that opportunity. I sneak out of the heel position, wrong. I bring the dog back, I'm like, yeah, I got you. It becomes a game. So now when we're walking, the dog is paying attention to me because the dog is expecting me to try to leave the heel position. Once I get to the point where the dog goes ahead of me, I say heel and the dog jumps back into heel position, then I can start adding corrections. So just like anything else, I start to walk. If I see an opportunity to sneak out of the dog's heel position or the dog just starts walking ahead of me, I make sure the dog is clearly out of heel position. This is very important. You do not want to correct the dog when they are in heel position because the heel position should be the best position for the dog to be in. The dog should go anytime I wanna be in the safest, best position where I get treats, pet, love, and I'm never corrected, that's the heel position. So I make sure it's very clear the dog is out of the heel position, they're far ahead of me, no. Then we pop the leash, giving the dog a correction. The dog's gonna turn around, we're gonna say heel, and then we're gonna guide the dog back into the heel position the same way we did before with the leash pressure. Once the dog's back in the heel position, we turn off the pressure. Nice, way to go, good job, buddy. If we do it correctly, the dog should quickly learn how to maintain the heel position. Often, what I highly recommend doing, and this is something I'm trying to incorporate this more in my video, so as I mentioned earlier, Yesterday we spent all day filming and I was working with different people and their dogs, all great dogs, very sweet, fun to work with. And what you're going to see is the small differences in hand movement and body language and handling of the leash that you see with someone who's first learning in comparison to someone who's been doing it for 10 years. You need to film yourself when you first start learning how to train. Because when you film yourself, you're going to be able to identify mistakes that you're making. I noticed with my own training, I started to get better much faster once I started to film myself and studying the footage. Same if you're an athlete, if you played sports, if you've done any sort of anything that requires physical movement, dancing, sports, uh, martial arts. You film yourself and then you review the footage to identify the mistakes that you make. And as a lot of you already know, the most common mistake that people make is pairing their physical with their verbal. But body language also plays a big role, how we handle the leash. And in these videos where I'm working with people who are new to dog training, you can see some of these mistakes a little bit more clearly and that's going to help you identify if you're making the same mistakes. But filming yourself is something I cannot stress enough. It is incredibly, incredibly important. Again, once I started filming myself, I became a much better dog trainer and I was slow at learning how to train dogs. It took me a long time. I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I think the first dog I was training, it took two months before I got the dog to do it down on the verbal command alone. I was like, what is going on? And my timing was wrong, my reward delivery was off, my praise would be at the wrong spot. And because of that, the process of teaching my dog was much slower than it is now when we fix the timing. So film yourself and that's gonna, again, help you identify some of the small subtle mistakes that you may be making that you don't notice. Okay, so, that's all the questions for channel members. So now I'm gonna go to the live video and I'm gonna start going through some of the questions, maybe another 10 minutes or so. So let's go up to the very top. Uh, Australian Kettle Dog. Okay, so the first one is about a dog that was taught to attack cats and you have two cats. This is a tough situation, and the reason why is you don't want to risk the well-being of your cats. If I have a dog that is cat aggressive, I'm going to do my best to keep them separated. To me, it's not worth the risk of possibly having one of your cats attacked or, worst case scenario, one of your cats killed 
by the dog. So I would keep them separated. That's going to be the safest option. If you don't want to keep them separated, then I would definitely muzzle train the dog and then I would do a ton of obedience with reliability, meaning I'm implementing corrections and I'm making sure the dog is doing what it is that I want them to do. But I'm not going to, I don't want to let that, that cat and that dog interact because it's going to be high risk. Even if you have a muzzle on, the dog could still end up muzzle punch, punching the cat. So that's going to be something that Yeah, I mean, you even said that the previous owners made the dog go after cats and even killing them sometimes. So, yeah, my my recommendation is to keep them separated. If you don't want to, muzzle train the dog. Have the muzzle on all the time until you are 100% certain that the dog's not going to attack the cats. And you can try to use uh, counter conditioning, desensitizing the dog slowly, exposing the dog to the cat with the muzzle on, creating strong positive associations. And if the dog does try to attack the cat, I would correct that behavior. But again, I would just keep them separated. All right, if you crate train at home first, it would make it easier. Yeah, crate training is good. Okay. Good morning from Japan, awesome. All right, let me see. I uh, love the book and the videos. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I am working on my second book. The second book is going to be way more detailed than the first one. The first one was just a manual. It was, you know, and I call it a manual because I don't really consider it to be the length of a standard book. You can get through my manual if you're a fast reader in under an hour. Uh, if you're a slower reader, even two hours, you can get through it. But the idea was I wanted to put the information in the most condensed way possible to easily consume and use it as a reference. So I didn't include any sort of anecdotes to explain how I use the training in different areas. I wanted to be, this is the science, this is how you apply it, this is how you get results, and this is what you do if you're running into sort of issues, just like on my episode, Behavioral and, Modific uh, Behavioral and Modification Flowchart. All right, let's see. Get yourself a balanced trainer. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to read to see where the next question is. Okay, so we have one that it seems like she barks a lot, barks at other dogs, even barks at the TV. If you want, if you have a dog that barks a lot, you can teach a quiet command. Now, this is something that I'm okay talking about it on a live Q&A, especially 52 minutes into it. If you're still watching, it means you're really interested in dog training. If you look up videos on how to teach a dog to be quiet, what you're usually going to find is teach the dog how to bark and then teach the dog to be quiet. So a good example would be you knock on the wall, the dog barks, you reward that behavior. Then when the dog's quiet, you say quiet, good dog, and you reward that. Sounds great. Problem is, doesn't work. The best way to teach the quiet command, excuse me, from my experience Remember, if we wanna teach our dogs a commanded behavior, what do we have to be able to do? Well, of course, we wanna teach our dogs the markers. That's going to help us communicate with them in a timely manner when they're right and wrong. And then when we're teaching a behavior, we wanna make sure we can get the dog to do the behavior with the physical cue. When we know we can get our dog to do the behavior with the physical cue, then we can put it on a command. But if I have a dog that's barking, and I have no way of stopping that dog from barking by using a physical cue, then I'm not going to be able to teach the dog a quiet command. So first, I try using leash pressure. So I have the dog in front of me. I know the dog's going to bark. We talked about this before. We set the dogs up to fail so we can correct them at the exact moment they make the mistake, just like we set them up to succeed so we can reward them at the exact moment they do the right behavior. So I have the dog on the leash, I'm sitting there, the dog barks, I say quiet, then I apply leash pressure by lifting up on the leash, 
The moment the dog stops barking, I turn off the pressure, good dog. Now this will work with some dogs. The leash pressure is enough to get the dog to go, okay, I'm not going to continue to bark. Every time the dog barks, you go quiet, you apply the pressure, the dog stops barking, turn off the pressure, good dog. That will work on some. For the dogs that that does not work on, then what I do, instead of treating the command quiet as a marker for negative reinforcement, because as you can see, that's almost the same thing. If you think about it, how's that any different from going wrong and applying leash pressure, right? It's the same thing, wrong leash pressure, quiet leash pressure. Well, the difference is wrong always guarantees negative reinforcement. It's a marker, whereas quiet is a command. Just like every other command that we're teaching our dog, we stop using the physical cue once the dog starts to respond on the verbal command alone. After enough of those, your dog barks, you say quiet, the dog goes, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to apply leash pressure, which is going to cause me to stop barking. So I'm going to stop barking before you apply the leash pressure. Boom. Now we've taught it on the command. So now after you say quiet, you no longer have to apply leash pressure because the dog is responding to the quiet command. It's the same if we're using a correction. So the dogs that the leash pressure doesn't work. Now I like to start with leash pressure first. Remember anytime we're trying to develop reliability within our obedience and how we're communicating with our dogs, we always want to use the least amount of force necessary in order to accomplish the goal. So leash pressure first. If that doesn't work, then I'm going to treat the word quiet as a condition punisher. So no is my marker for a correction. That means it's a conditioned punisher. It's been conditioned to be positive punishment, conditioned punisher. So then it would be the same as the dog barks, no correction, but instead of saying no, you're going to say quiet correction. The dog barks, quiet correction, making sure we say quiet before the correction. After enough of those, your dog barks, you say quiet before you make the correction, the dog stops barking. Now we know we have it on the verbal command. So the next time you tell your dog quiet, you don't have to correct because now the dog knows that when you say quiet, they need to be quiet. So that would be the difference of using quiet instead of using no, because no, again, is a marker that guarantees the dog's going to receive a correction. So that is what works for me when it teaches, when we're trying to teach a dog not to bark. But same thing you have to keep in mind, if your dog is really excited about barking, then it may not work the first time. So then what do you wanna do? Well, you wanna put the dog in a situation where you know they're going to bark, but the dog's not going to be as motivated to bark if perhaps the dog is right next to a bunch of other dogs on leash and the dog's barking going crazy because of that situation. Maybe you go, oh, well, this situation, the dog might bark, but the dog's not as motivated to bark. It's not as intense of a bark. Okay, great, that's where I'm gonna wanna start because it's going to be easier to stop a bark that involves less motivation than it is to stop a bark where the dog is very motivated to bark. And then just like everything else, we can gradually increase the difficulty as the dog understands it by making the environment more challenging. All right, I hope that answers the question. Okay, what is your stand on prong collars, particularly for Belgian Malinois? Does the difficulty of the breed make it necessary to use in the context of insecurity or aggression? Okay, if we're going to talk training collars, with my own personal dogs and with dogs that I have trained for other people when I'm doing stay and train, I prefer to use a remote training collar. My dogs are trained on remote training collars. Any other dog that I train, I like to use a remote training collar because it gives me that off-leash reliability, off-leash obedience. I recommend a prong collar to people that do not want to use a remote training collar but they are unable to get their dog to comply with a martingale. This is something I talk about in my manual. Every dog has their own bank account. Some are very rich, some are very poor. The dogs that are more wealthy tend to need a higher correction 
in order to stop the bad behavior, where a dog that may not be as wealthy needs a smaller correction in order to get them to comply. So some dogs have very, very high correction levels where other dogs, you don't need to correct them as much, depending on the dog's sensitivity. So if I have a dog, I like to start with the martingales. Just like I said earlier, we start with the least amount of force necessary. If I have a dog that's working on a martingale and I make a light little leash pop and that dog goes, sorry, I won't do that again. Great, I'm gonna stay with the martingale collar. But if I have a dog where I try to correct the dog and the dog ignores the correction, they go, I don't care about that. That doesn't have an impact on me. Okay, this dog, I have to go up to a prong collar. Just like anything else though, we wanna make sure we teach the dog the rules before we start adding correction. So we always wanna go through that process. The only time I correct a dog for a behavior that they have not been taught not to do would be dangerous or destructive behaviors. If I have a dog that digs, I'm going to correct it right away. If I have a dog that wants to chase cars, I'm going to correct it. If I have a dog that wants to uh, bite at people's clothing because they're hurting them, I'm probably gonna correct that right away. Everything else, we wanna teach the dog what the rules are, make sure they fully understand it, they know how to turn on pressure by complying, we've done leash pressure, we've taught them the rules, given them a clear path to success, then we can start adding corrections. If I'm going to introduce a dog to a prong collar, First, of course, we have to make sure the prong collar is fitting properly. If you watch videos on it, you'll see they say, make sure the prong collar is as high up close to the dog's head as possible. Yes, you want to do that, but the collar is going to slide down a little bit. Gravity has an effect. You don't want it so tight that it's already implementing a correction without applying any pressure, but you don't want it to be so loose that you can slip it over the dog's head. So we want to keep it high. It also depends, let's say you're using a medium prong collar. The prongs are about an inch long. So what happens to me every time I'm using a prong collar, either I put it on and it's slightly too tight, or I add an extra prong and now it's slightly too loose. Very rarely is it going to fit perfectly. Of course, you adjust with the prongs, but what I mean is that inch, whether you add it or take it away, the dog could need an extra half an inch, but all you can do is add or take away an inch. So if that makes sense, it could either be slightly too big or slightly too small, but you do want to sit up higher on the dog's neck. If I have multiple collars on a dog, it goes prong collar, remote collar, flat collar at the bottom. And then of course, if you wanna have the dog wearing a harness. When I introduce the dog to a prong collar, first I wanna make sure the dog knows leash pressure with a flat collar. So I'm gonna do all that leash pressure training. I'm gonna get the dog to be very aware of the leash. And so they know how to turn off that pressure the moment it's applied. Again, it's another tool that we can use to communicate with our dogs. Then when I put the prong collar on, I'm going to go through the same leash pressure training. With a prong collar, the dog has to know how to turn off that pressure. Remember with our training, as I said earlier, least amount of force necessary, but also least amount of stress necessary. We do not want to stress our dogs out. Now, of course, if we give our dogs a correction, there's going to be a little bit of stress, but we want to minimize any stress. And because of that, we're going to go through that leash pressure training with the prong collar. Again, the dog must know how to turn off that pressure. So then if the dog is ready for corrections, the dog has a larger bank account, I can make a correction with a prong collar. For people that wanna use a remote training collar, but they're still having a hard time holding the remote, holding the leash, because if you have heard me talk about getting a dog directional to a remote training collar, you can't take a remote training collar, put it on a dog, and just start correcting them for obedience and expect the dog to understand. What's gonna happen is the dog's not gonna know what's causing those corrections and you're going to create fear. If you don't teach a dog what a remote training collar is, you can use it for dangerous behavioral issues such as digging or getting into the trash. The moment the dog starts to dig, you stimulate the collar, you get to be the good guy. What happened, buddy? Did that dirt bite you? And now the dog, now the dog is no longer digging, great. But if you're trying to use a remote training collar for obedience, 
Then I have to teach the dog that I'm the one correcting them. And I do that by pairing every single correction with the leash. So if I tell the dog to sit and the dog chooses not to sit, I have the remote in my hand. I say, no, I lightly pop the leash. The exact moment I pop the leash, I stimulate the collar. Then I repeat the command I want the dog to perform, sit. And then I assist the dog into the sit position, either with a lure or leash pressure. I'm gonna make sure the dog's successful. But bottom line, every time we correct the dog with the remote collar, we have to pair with the leash. Now that's very difficult for some people. Now that's very difficult for some people. And if that is the case, when you're first starting out, I always recommend practicing on yourself. Make sure you can do it on yourself before you do it on your dog. Uh, the remote training collars that I use, I like e-collar technology and I like Dogtra. If you watch the live Q, not live Q&A, if you watch the podcast episode that I did with Jacob, uh, another excellent dog trainer, Jacob Placencia, he uses the brand, I believe it's called Chameleon Remote Training Collars. He says they're excellent. He's a very good dog trainer, so I do trust his opinion. I haven't personally used those. I use Dogtra and e-collar technology. Okay, let's see where we are. Great Wolf Tactic. Os, very nice. Os, for those of you that don't know what that is, that's a jujitsu thing. As many of you probably already know, I'm a huge fan of jujitsu. I love it. It's one of those things that I think if you can do it, you should do it. It's amazing. Okay. Okay, I just discussed prong collars. Okay, I'm having a hard time getting my friends and family to ignore bad behavior. They behave with no manners because it works sometimes. Yeah, and if that is the case, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pretend like other people that are interacting with your dog are just new distractions that you have to learn how to train and work through. So I would still just have certain expectations for my dog, and I would reinforce those in the situation that the dog is currently in. A good example might be begging. Let's say you don't want your dog to beg, and I posted a video on this last week. When a dog is begging, often the dog is acting a behavior that they were rewarded for in the past, meaning we get our dogs, we have them look at us, and we, we say, if you look at me, I'm going to pay you, especially when we're doing engagement training. So then when we have our own food, the dog goes, you have food, I sit, I stare at you, you give me food, that's the deal we worked out. If that is happening, I simply tell the dog what I want them to do. I say, no, I want you to go to your climb bed. And then I reinforce that. So let's say you're at the house, family, they go to sit down to eat lunch or something. And let's say maybe you're on a call and you're sitting on the couch and you see them at the dinner table and the dog goes up and the dog starts to beg. Well, if you know they're not going to reinforce the rules, then it's going to be your responsibility at that moment in time to tell the dog climb. And if you need to take the dog and direct it to their climb bed or whatever behavior you want your dog to do. Maybe you call your dog to you. But bottom line is, you are going to reinforce what you want your dog to do in any situation, regardless of what other people in the family are doing. And if you're not there, when that's taking place, then it's kind of difficult. There's really not much you can do about it at that point, but your dog will be, be better behaved when you are there. I hope that answers the question. All right, let's see. Yeah, and so someone said, I really like prong collars. Just make sure it's a Herm Springer. Yes, Herm Springer. If you're going to use a prong collar, you want to use Herm Springer. Sorry, I'm trying to find another question. I, I noticed a lot of people are communicating with one another in the comments. Okay, this is a funny one. How do I stop my dog from chasing her tail? Every time she starts to chase her tail, 
Tell her what you want her to do. A very easy one for that is going to be the down command or come when called. I'm just going to redirect that dog to a different behavior every single time the dog starts to chase their own tail. If we think about cause and effect, the dog will learn every time I go to chase my tail, I have to go into the down. I don't wanna go into the down right now. I'm not going to chase my tail. That's not something I would want to correct. I would rather direct it to a behavior I want the dog to perform. So pick a behavior you would rather your dog do. And the moment your dog starts to chase her own tail, tell your dog what you want her to do and then assist her if needed, whether using a lure or leash pressure up until the point when your dog starts to chase her own tail and you tell her what to do. She does it on her own without the help of the physical cue and then continue to do that and eventually she will probably stop chasing her tail. I can't, I can't guarantee it, but just like anything else, if we want reliability, when you start to tell her what to do, if she chooses to ignore you, then you can correct her for that. But if you want to stop the behavior first, redirect it to something else, teach your dog that it's not something you want her to do. You can also say wrong and reinforce with the leash pressure or whatever you want your marker to be. And then on a long enough timeline, if she doesn't start stopping that behavior on her own, then you can correct the behavior. So just like any other behavioral issue, if it's not dangerous or destructive, so this wouldn't be dangerous or destructive. Uh, I guess it could be dangerous. No, not really. But, uh, if the behavior is something we just don't want the dog to perform, first we teach them what we want them to do when they do that behavior, then we can reinforce with corrections. So let's use jumping up on furniture, dog jumps, on, jumps up on furniture, I say wrong, I guide the dog off. Dog starts to spin, I say wrong, I guide the dog into a different position. After enough of those, dog jumps up on the couch, I say wrong, the dog jumps off. The dog is spinning, I say wrong, the dog stops spinning. Once that happens, now I know I can add positive punishment to stop the behavior entirely. The dog jumps up on the couch, no, correction, off. Then I cue the dog off. The dog's spinning, no, correction. The dog stops spinning, good dog, or chasing their own tail. Okay. Easy way to teach the dog to not jump out an open window. King jumped out the window to try to get to me today. Uh, King was on the leash in the truck, and my buddy said I had to let go. Okay, that's going to be a behavior I would consider dangerous, so I would correct that behavior. I would set up a training situation where I'm going to work with the dog on that specific issue. I'm going to make sure the window is open enough that the dog can jump out. And when the dog tries to jump out, no correction and I will continue to reinforce those rules up until the point where the dog stops trying to, what's wrong with Caesar Milan's methods? Stop trying to jump out the car. Um, so someone just said, what's wrong with Caesar Milan's methods? You'd have to ask a specific method in order for me to address. Caesar Milan has changed and he's adapted a lot of his training over the years. If you look back at a lot of his old videos, alpha rolling dogs, dominating the dogs, those are not good techniques. It's not something you wanna do. I wrote an article about Caesar Milan a few years back and I tried finding footage of him alpha rolling dogs and I really was having a hard time finding any footage. I couldn't find any. If you look hard enough, you'll be able to find it, but I don't think he practices that anymore. I don't think he does the alpha rolling anymore. That was something he did a long time ago. So just like everybody else, we all adapt, we all become better. And if it's not, if he doesn't alpha roll dogs anymore, then I'm not gonna hold that against him. I'm not going to judge that. I try to get people away from the concept of thinking they need to be the alpha. If you're in a situation, it's more important that you know what to do instead of what body language to present. So for example, often people are told, be calm, confident. Well, it's very difficult to be calm and confident when you don't know what to do. So it's more important for me to teach what they're supposed to do in the situation, and then confidence will come as a byproduct. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, and. I have nothing against any dog trainers. Caesar Milan is just very well known. And I've seen a lot of people, especially in the Los Angeles area, 
alpha roll their dogs. Their dog does something, they hold the dog down and they go and they make that noise. That's not good. We don't want to alpha roll dogs. So I saw him at a live event. It was, if you look up um, IQ, I think is what it's called. It's now called Impact Theory. Some of you may be familiar with it, but it was a talk show by this guy, Tom something, and it used to be called Inside uh, Quest, IQ. And because he was one of the owners of Quest Nutrition. I was invited to see the interview with Cesar Milan. I don't think they ever posted it. After the interview, and it was very entertaining, Cesar Milan is incredibly charismatic. I went up to him afterwards, I talked to him momentarily, and then he did a live training for everybody with Tom's dog. So Tom had a little chihuahua that was really excited. Yes, I do talk too much. So very, the dog was very excited around other dogs and he needed help with it. So he asked Cesar Milan to help him. So Cesar Milan brought out his uh, pit bull that he has. I don't know the name of his pit bull, but he took his pit bull and he put his pit bull in a downstay and the dog did a very nice downstay. And then he went back Back to my question, please. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. I, I, I do have ADD. Uh, what was your question? Jumping out the window. Yeah, correcting it. So you're going to want to correct that arm and hammer. When you set it up as a training situation, when your dog goes to jump out, correct the behavior. No correction. Recommand what you want and then assist if necessary. That's going to be a dangerous behavior. So I'm going to correct it right away and I'm not going to let the dog do it. Okay, sorry. I want to tell the story uh, that Caesar Milan did. So he is telling Tom, he goes, okay, we have to be the calm, assertive leader. We have to make sure the dog's in a calm, submissive state. And the dog is trying to get to Caesar's pit bull. And, and every time that the dog got excited, Caesar Milan lifted up on the leash and pushed down on the Chihuahua's butt. Once the dog sat, he turned off the pressure. So he was good at that handling. And he's like, see, I'm, I'm in a calm position. I'm being the leader. I'm showing the dog what I want. And then he started to walk closer to his pit bull. The, the chihuahua became excited. Caesar stopped, put the dog in a sit the same way he did before, waited till the dog was calm and started to walk forward again. If the chihuahua became excited, Caesar Milan stopped, placed him back into the sit. So all he did was he made the dog sit and then when the dog was relaxed, he walked forward. So he was telling the dog, when you do what I want, we will go do what you want, but you have to do what I want first. And he continued to do that all the way up until the point where the Chihuahua was able to meet Caesar Milan's dog and it was great. And people were like, oh, this is awesome. What he did was, was great. The actual training was really nice. But if you were watching it, you would go home and be like, I gotta be the leader and, and you wouldn't know what to do because he wasn't actually explaining that he was using the leash and he was placing the dog into a sit. So all he did was he made the dog sit. He said, I want you to sit. I want you to walk nice and slowly. And then we can go say hi. And every time you get excited, I'm going to make you sit. That's what he did. And he did it beautifully. He explained it in a way that was difficult to understand. If you make things difficult for people to understand and you make it difficult for them to implement, then they're always going to need you. So one of my goals as a dog trainer was I want to be able to have a training session be so clear and effective that people only need a couple sessions. That's another reason why I made my manual because if I go do a lesson, and I talk really fast. I've been working really hard on slowing down how fast I talk. And I go to a lesson, I say, all right, the first thing we're gonna do is engagement training. Let's get the dog engaged. Make sure you say the marker before you deliver the reward. We go through that. Now we're gonna do leash pressure. Make sure you mark when the dog completes the behavior. Now we're gonna teach the dog leash pre or uh, luring. Then we're gonna do leash pressure. Now we're going to add the command. Now we're gonna work on the stay. When the dog breaks, you're gonna say wrong. But And I go through this whole thing in a short amount of time and I make sure they can do every step. Now, if I left after that, they're not gonna remember. That was too much information in such a short amount of time. But after the lesson, they can go to chapter seven in my manual and they can go, hey, what was step one? Oh, step one is engagement training. How do I do it? Oh yeah, I do it like this. Awesome, beautiful. How I can do it my way. 
Uh, I, I'm thinking you guys are talking to each other again. Anyway, sorry. Now I'm, I'm going in different directions here. Let's see another question we have. Uh, looks like some separation anxiety has chewed on the wood molding around the front door and doorknob. Does not destroy anything else. He is a rescue. If I have a dog that I'm working on separation anxiety, you're going to want to do some crate training. If you have your dog out, your dog is going to be able to be destructive. Inside of a crate, the dog's not going to be able to be destructive. Crate training is great. But in addition, oh, let's see what this is. Sorry, I got to go to this question. Dog barks aggressively when panhandlers approach my car. He redirects to chew and thrash seatbelt. What should I do? All right. Um, in a situation, I, I'd have to see the situation. What I would probably do is I would use leash pressure to prevent the dog. But if I know the dog is going to start to become destructive and start chewing and biting the seatbelt, I'm going to do muzzle uh, work. I'm going to do muzzle training. That's going to prevent the dog from being able to chew. So the most he'll be able to do is muzzle punch the seat. And that's not going to do nearly as much damage as actually being able to bite it and rip the seat apart. So I'm going to do muzzle training, which I do have a video on that. And then again, I'm going to set this situation up as much as possible up until the point where the dog stops doing it. You might ask yourself, well, how do I set that up? Uh, I can't leash pressure as I'm driving. Uh, well, I'm assuming that you're parked because you're saying panhandlers will approach your car. You probably want to do it with someone else in the car to help out, but you're going to have to be able to control the dog. That's going to be very important. Intersection, stopping at an intersection. Another option is to transport your dog in a crate. That's what I do if I'm if I'm driving my dogs from one location to another. I used to always put them in a crate. Now I have a Toyota Prius hatchback, which I love, by the way. It's excellent with gas. And the back, I have it, uh, one of those gates that prevents the dogs from moving forward. So they have their back area, so it acts as a kennel. But a kennel is another good option. If I If you have to... Have someone in the vehicle with you, muzzle train your dog, and then redirect to the behavior that you want your dog to perform. What's really important, anytime we're trying to get our dog to do a specific behavior and they don't want to do it, we have to make sure that we win. We follow through. A good example of this would be, I've taken plenty of dogs on walks where halfway through the walk, the dog just goes, nope, I'm not doing it anymore and I go to apply leash pressure to get the dog to continue walking forward, and the dog knows leash pressure, but the dog is choosing not to be compliant, and they put on the brakes even more. I'm gonna use this again. So let's say I go to apply that pressure, and the dog says, I'm not moving forward. Then what I do is I say, no, pop the leash, and then I go right back to the pressure. And the dog goes, oh, I need to move forward. Or if I'm using a remote training collar, I apply the leash pressure, the dog decides not to move forward, I press the continuation button, the moment the dog moves forward, I turn off the continuation button. Yes, you can use a remote training collar. If it's fear-based, that could cause more issues. Not knowing if it's fear-based or if it's self-rewarding or self-reinforcing behavior, then that's going to, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, act more on the side of caution, and I'm going to assume that it's a fear-based behavior. So then I'm not going to correct it unless I know for certain it's not fear-based, then I can correct. But if you correct and it's fear-based, you're going to make the, the situation worse than what it already is. Uh, but yes, muzzle train, leash pressure training, use correction if it's not fear-based, have somebody in the car with you or have your dog in a crate while you transport them, which is probably the better option because it's safe. Having a car, uh, a dog loose in the car can be very dangerous. Yeah, and just like BK said, if it's fear-based, it can make it worse. Uh, the basic obedience playlist is helping. That's awesome. I really appreciate the kudos. No, I have not seen the movie Dog. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy that a lot of the training is helpful, and I want to keep 
putting out content, more dogs. So uh, a good example is I've had people say they've seen some of the training techniques, they tried on their own dog and it's not working. That's why now I'm trying to, I'm going to try to do a lot of videos of training lessons where I'm working with different people. So common mistakes that people make is going to be available to view. So then it makes it easier to adjust and fix your own mistakes. Because from what I've seen when I'm working with people, a lot of times the dog is excellent. We start working, the dog is very responsive. They're doing everything really nicely. I hand the leash off to the owner and they're doing something just slightly different than the way that I'm, maybe they're not holding the food the same way. Maybe they're not turning their wrist correctly. Maybe they're not holding the leash in the right hand. These little differences, once they make the adjustment, boom, now the dog's doing it really beautifully. So it's something I talked about again earlier in this episode is to film your own training. Uh, you know, I always tell myself, I'm only going to do an hour. I'm only going to do an hour. And then I always end up going over because I always have such a good time doing this. Let's see. Oh, interesting. Uh, so in your state, BK, the law is that you have to transport the dog in a kennel. Which, which state is that? Oh, I'm happy the training worked. Thank you again. And... All this training, I didn't make any of it up. I just had the opportunity to learn from some of the best dog trainers in the world. Uh, one of my videos, somebody had posted a comment. They said, you're stealing everything from Michael Ellis. And I was like, I'm not, I always talk about Michael Ellis. I think Michael Ellis is one of the best dog trainers out there. A lot of what I learned came from Michael Ellis. I don't think it's stealing if you give the person kudos all the time. Forrest Mickey, amazing trainer, learned a lot from him. Bart Bellin, I've learned a little bit from him because you have to pay for all his stuff and I can't find very much free stuff, but I've worked with people that have worked with Bart Bellin. Uh, I read Ivan Belobanov's book, amazing trainer. Tom Rose, incredible. Dave Van Garderen, incredible. So I've just had these, these really fortunate opportunities to work with some of the best trainers and have been able to translate it in a way that was easy for me to understand. And I think that's what made it very easy for others to understand. Uh, I will be getting uh, three, okay. So I will be getting three eight week old puppies at once. <laughs> okay, it's gonna be the same process as, uh, yes, Tim. <laughs> So if you have three puppies coming in at the same time, it's it's going to be the same as if you had one puppy. It's just now you got three. So they're going to be, I would crate train them. I'm going to work on potty training. I would train each one, one at a time. You're going to want to do confidence building exercises. If you're starting from scratch, I recommend watching my video, Everything You Need to Know to Train Your Dog. That's the basic obedience series compressed into the shortest amount of time possible by still providing all the necessary information. It's just under three hours, but it is a step-by-step -step process. That's what I would watch and study if you're going to uh, be working with three brand new dogs, three brand new puppies. But with puppies, I'm really big on confidence building. We always wanna make sure, confidence building and playing with puppies. Playing with puppies is huge. So when I get a new puppy, as I said before, crate training is important, house training is important, making the dog enjoy obedience. I spend a lot of time, a lot of time playing with puppies, and I spend a lot of time building their confidence. Confidence building exercises, all that is, is introducing your dog to new things while making it a pleasant experience. Never intentionally scare your dog. I've seen people do that. They think it's funny. They're scaring their dog. That has the exact opposite effect of confidence building. It's the same with people. We wanna constantly build their confidence. And I say that it's same, same with people too, because I've seen, I, I don't know why people are doing this, 
but on TikTok, people will like intentionally scare their infant. And in my head, I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? Why would you scare a baby? Because you think it's funny for TikTok. I don't know. Okay. Let me see. People have issues due to minor differences. Seems like it would be a good opportunity to set up services for Zoom consultations. Yes, and I do offer uh, Zoom, so that's a great point. Great wolf. Um, doing the videos with people, though, and showing those common mistakes, I think that's going to add a lot of value as well. So we got a lot of great footage in. Thank you very much, Vera. I appreciate that. What kind of feeding schedule would you say is the best for a 10 week old puppy? How many hours apart for meals? Should I worry about restricting her eating window to a 10 to 12 hour period? For me with puppies, I don't worry about, um, I start to regulate how much I feed puppies. Let me rephrase that. I start to regulate how much I feed dogs. So when I, when I have a puppy, if that puppy will take food, I'm going to keep feeding it and keep training it. I give puppies a ton of food, but I'm also doing a lot of play. So the schedule that I like to do, and uh, and okay, thank you so much for that 60. I really appreciate that. Uh, for new puppy that I'm training, I don't have a set feeding schedule. I feed them when I train. And I take them out and I train them as many times as I can throughout the day, which usually is one to three training sessions. If the only time I'm concerned about how much a puppy is eating is if the puppy is not eating enough, but I'm not worried about a puppy getting fat. Once they become an adult, then I regulate how much they eat. But as a puppy, if they wanna keep taking the food and they wanna keep training, I'm gonna keep training them, always ending on a good note. Uh, you answer the person below me. Oh, where's your question? I'm not seeing it. Our dog is acting different since we brought baby home and is pushing boundaries. What can we do? Okay, so you have a new baby in the house and that's going to have a little bit of an impact or an effect on the dog. I'm just going to work with the dog as if there's nothing new in the environment, meaning I'm going to approach every single situation the same way I would depending on where the dog is within their training process. So for example, let's say you have certain boundaries in the house where your dog is not allowed to go to, but now your dog is not following the rules and the dog is going into the restricted areas, I'm going to treat it the same way I was when I was training. So let's say your dog's not allowed in a certain room. Let's say your dog's not allowed in the kitchen, but now you have the baby in the high chair, the baby's eating or whatever, I don't know where, where you are with that, but like, let's say that's the situation, baby's in the high chair in the kitchen, dog's not allowed in the kitchen, the dog starts coming into the kitchen. I would start, I would correct the dog for that. If the dog already knows the rules, then I'm going to correct the dog and I'm going to recommand what I want the dog to do. So the dog goes into the kitchen, the moment the dog crosses that line, no, I'm gonna walk over, give the dog a correction, recommand to where I want the dog to go. Can you give me a specific situation? And then we'll discuss that and I'll address that. I think that'll be more helpful. How do I get my Malinois to slow down when tracking and also when walking? He stresses a lot and is in a hurry no matter what the exercise. Okay, so tracking. I would not consider myself a true expert in tracking. Tom Rose is amazing. I've tracked a couple dogs. If I'm trying to slow a dog down, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some of the guidance and direction that I learned from Tom Rose. And Tom Rose is a wizard when it comes to teaching tracking. He teaches when you first start teach when you first start to teach your dog tracking, you want to do the tracking box. I'm not sure if you've done the tracking box or not, but the tracking box is excellent. I have a video on that. And then we're going to start doing straight lines. The way Tom Rose does is every single footprint, he will put a piece of food. So the dog smells where the footprint is and they get the food. The same way that we start to space out rewards with obedience is the same way 
we start to space out the rewards with tracking. So now after the dog has done some straight lines, maybe we started adding turns in the track. Are you, okay, this is actually a good question. Are you rewarding your dog when they get to the article? When I was an assistant instructor at the Tom Rose School, there are certain students, their dogs would track very quickly because the dog's goal was to get to the article and indicate because that's where the student was giving the dog the biggest reward. So the dog was very motivated to get to the article in order to get that reward. And what we did was we stopped rewarding the dog at the article and we added more treats within the track. If we noticed the dog was starting to go too fast, we would add more treats in the track. And then once we started getting the dog to perform nice and slow, we would gradually place less and less treats on the track. And that would usually start to slow them down. So going back a step if needed will help. And then not giving the dog a big jackpot at the, the actual article where the dog is indicating. I hope that's helpful. Again, I'm not I'm not an expert at tracking. When every time I did tracking, I would just use a ton of food to get the dog to stay on the track. And then your other one was also when walking, he stresses a lot and is in a hurry no matter what the exercise. So that I'm going to treat as a basic heel command if I'm doing loose leash walking. And that's what it sounds like that you're working on. You're working on loose leash walking. It doesn't sound like you're doing a focused heel. And I'm going to reinforce that the same way I would with any sort of loose leash walking. I'm not going to allow the dog to go faster just because the dog wants to. And that's going to give us an opportunity to reinforce whether we're on the step where we're using leash pressure or we're giving the dog a correction, recommanding what we want, and then assisting them back into the position. But I'm not gonna let the dog go very quickly. In fact, when I'm working with a dog, let's say a lot of times when I take dogs on a walk, I'll go around the neighborhood. I'll go around a couple blocks. So the dog figures out that path pretty quickly. And when you start getting back to the house, some dogs will start to speed up. They're ready to go back to the house. And if I notice that, I'm gonna to continue to do the speed that I'm doing because the dog has to go with my speed, not the other way around. And then I'm not gonna to go to the house, I'm gonna go past the house. So I'm gonna show the dog like, we're not always gonna do exactly what you think we're going to do. I'm going to change up the pattern a little bit. Making healing fun should help a little bit with that. If your dog is stressed out, have you incorporated more um, exercise? Often when we add more exercise, in with the dog's routine that can help with their stress their anxiety the same you know with people um, let's see my rough collie 1.5 years old is very reactive while on leash he's cool when nothing is happening but if a dog walks towards us he starts pulling and whining in excitement okay uh and thank you uh by the way I talked about this earlier on this live q and If, okay, so this goes towards the concept of generalized, uh, okay, here, I'm actually gonna post a link real quick. If you haven't watched this video, I highly recommend watching this video, but I'm gonna talk about it as well. I just wanna pull it up very quickly. Okay. All right, I'm going to add this in the comments. So if you're working with your dog, you're able to get your dog to perform and listen to you in most situations, but then in other situations, it seems as if you cannot control your dog. This breaks down the step-by-step -step process that I like to follow when it comes to working with our dog in new environments. A good analogy would be, um, video games like if you ever played a video game think about it in the very beginning you start at the first level the last level is going to be much harder than level one progress through environments the same way with your dog don't go from level one difficulty 
to level 10, you're gonna struggle and you're going to have a hard time. You wanna make each new environment gradually a little bit more difficult than the last environment. But a lot of times I've worked with people where they're having issues, where their dog is being very reactive while on leash. We go through the normal training process. So you don't want to skip any of the steps within the training. And what I mean by that is, I can't tell you how many sessions I've done where they wanna work on loose leash walking or the dog being reactive, whatever it is. And I get there and they go, they're already outside, they have the dog on a leash and they go, you ready for a walk? And this is the very, yes, Jonathan Katz. Yeah, he's awesome as well, learned a lot from him too. Uh, there's plenty more that I didn't mention. But anyways, let me go back to what I was saying. And I get there for the lesson and they have the dog and they're ready to go on a walk. And this is the very first lesson that I've done with them. And they say, you ready for that walk? And I say, no, we're not ready. We have to first show the dog how we're going to communicate with them. Then we go inside the house. We work on the engagement training. We work on the luring. We work on the leash pressure. After we do all that, we show the dog how to find the heel position. Then we go on the walk. Now I can communicate with the dog and I can make it very clear. For dogs that become reactive, sometimes if we try to correct them, it could actually make them more excited and it seems as though the correction has made the issue worse than what it was before that. If I think that's a possibility, I'm going to start with leash pressure and I'm going to use the leash to cue the dog into a sit. If the dog continues to bark while I'm applying the leash pressure, then at that point, I could possibly give a no and then correct the dog. I have been in situations before where the dog is so excited that even a correction or leash pressure is not stopping the behavior. And if that is the case, and this is a behavior that's not based on fear, then I upgrade that dog to a remote training collar. Because if we can't correct the dog with the leash pop and it's not enough to stop the behavior, often we can get the results that we need with a remote training collar. Thank you, by the way. With a remote training collar, because the remote training collar gives us the opportunity to incre increase the correction until the dog complies. So the way that I do that is, just like I was talking about before, I do all the obedience, I teach the dog to be directional with the remote training collar. There's two very common ways in which people teach their dogs how to be directional with the remote collar. Either they do it the way that I do it, where anytime I correct the dog with a leash pop, at the exact moment I pop the leash, I stim the collar. That lets the dog know I'm the one applying the correction and it's not some sort of magical mystery force that the dog cannot understand. They go, you did that. I saw you pop the leash. I heard you say no. I felt the correction. Another way people teach their dogs to be directional is they pair the leash pressure with the continuation of the remote collar. If you watch that interview with Jonathan Katz, we talked about this. You use negative reinforcement to teach the remote training collar. When I use the remote training collar, I use it as positive punishment. When we use it as negative reinforcement, again, negative reinforcement, we turn pressure on. When the dog complies, we turn the pressure off. So when you're teaching a dog how to be directional to the remote training collar and you're using leash pressure, what you do is the moment the leash becomes tight, you press the continuation button on the collar and the moment the dog complies, you turn off the pressure. But when you're doing it as negative reinforcement, the setting on the collar is so low that the dog can barely even feel it. They're like, hmm, I feel something, but I'm not quite sure. But you pair with the leash. And once the dog sits, you turn off the pressure. Now, the way Jonathan Katz does it, which I really liked, is he'll just tap the nick button. So he treats that as, instead of holding down the continuation button, he taps the nick. So he applies the pressure, tap, 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 dog sits, he stops tapping. So the sitting turns off the sensation that the dog is feeling from the collar. So again, we use it as positive punishment, pairing it with the leash to teach them how to be directional, or we use it as negative reinforcement and we pair it with the leash and we can use that to get them to become directional. And I'm saying all this because if I teach the dog that I'm applying leash pressure and that's the cue to get the dog to sit, 
But the dog goes, I'm, I'm way too excited. I'm not gonna listen to that. And again, this is not based on fear. Then as I apply the leash pressure, I hit the continuation button on the remote training collar, and then I turn the collar up until the dog stops the bad behavior. The moment they stop, I turn it off. Then I instantly turn the collar back down to the setting that the dog is used to being on. And then if they, and of course we turn the pressure off on the leash as well. So you have to be good with your timing in order to stop, because remember, negative reinforcement only works if A, once the pressure is turned on, it's not turned off until they comply, and B, the moment they comply, we instantly have to turn it off. So more likely than not, if the dog gets really excited and it's not based on fear, that's going to be the process. So I know it sounds like a lot, but sometimes when we're working on an issue that seems very daunting, we're not going to be able to do it, go through those steps in the training process, take our time, and after maybe a few weeks, maybe a month, we're going to be able to solve that problem. Okay. Uh, where else were we?